Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church of Naples, and we are so happy that you have chosen to join us as we go through God's Word together. God's doing some amazing things here, and we pray that God's Word will transform you from the inside out. Our mission here is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ of all peoples. And our hope is, is that you are being a disciple that makes disciples. Now, if you don't have a church home, we would love for you to join us either in person or continuing online as we go into God's Word together every week. But if you are uh, a member of another church, we don't want this to be in any way, shape, form, or fashion a substitute uh, for you being connected to your local body. So our prayer is, is that God uses His Word to change you and to change others. So we pray that God will use you and this message for His glory. Have a great day. Take your copy of God's Word and turn to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 18. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we're so grateful to have you here. And the chair back in front of you is a little connection card, and you can fill out whatever information you want to share and turn that in one of our connection boxes, uh, which is also our offering box, or go to the Next Steps area out in the Commons, which is to your left, and we have a gift for you. Uh, before this service started, uh, I got news from Pastor Kevin. We have a new brother in Christ, Tyler, uh, gave his life to Christ just a few moments ago. So let's praise God for that. Amen. And we're so excited. We're so excited for what God is doing in that man's life. And I know that he's excited as well. All right, Genesis chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 18. Let's stand as we read God's word for a 17-hour sermon. I am jet lag. And so, well, I'm just kidding. It'll only be three hours. All right, verse 18. The Holy Spirit says through Moses, And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground, the Lord God for formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man uh, called every living creature, that was its name. And the Lord gave, and the man gave names to the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to the beasts of the field. Uh, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to the man. That's why men love eating ribs. We love <laughs> ribs. I love my prime rib. Her name is April. <laughs> then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. You may be seated. Those of you that are married in the room, um, I want to ask you a question. How many of you think that marriage is really easy? Only those who love putting puzzles together would say, yes. As we learned last weekend, Pastor Andy tell, told us that the Wells family uh, loves to put puzzles together. Uh, but I just want you to imagine that you have a, a giant 15,000-piece jigsaw puzzle in a cardboard box. And then I want you to imagine a married couple is locked up in a small room together, and the only way they can get out is they have to put the puzzle together. But here's the kicker. They have to put it together without the top of the box. In other words, they have no idea what the puzzle is supposed to look like. They are supposed to figure it out. More than likely, someone in that room is going to die. <laughs> Puzzles are hard enough on their own, even with a box top that tells you what they're supposed to look like. But without knowing the design of the puzzle, it is nearly impossible to put together. And this is what a lot of people feel like when it comes to their marriage. See, the pieces of the, of the puzzle of their lives are money and kids and sex and in-laws and time management and personality and wants and needs and church and friends and aging and health problems and conflict, career and fitness. And many, many married couples are struggling putting all the pieces together because they don't know what the ultimate design is. And because of that, many people will just give up. 
And this isn't just people outside the church, but even people inside the church. Statistics tell us that there is no real difference between people that are Christians and people that are non-Christians when it comes to the divorce rate. And so the question is, does God have a design for marriage? And if so, what is it? And the answer is absolutely yes. And as we are going through Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4, we're seeing here that Genesis gives us God's design. And so Genesis is a book of beginnings and everything that is has a beginning. And that beginning is rooted in the beginner who is God. And he, as we've learned, is our creator. Uh, he is the divine designer of everything. And he has a design that's perfect. And if we follow his design for our lives, we, it leads to blessings and to flourishing. And if we deviate from God's design, which is called sin, it leads to dysfunction and brokenness. And so the reason why marriages are broken is because we're broken. And the reason why we're broken is because we decide to go our way rather than God's way. And yet what I want you to learn is that the secret to being happily ever after isn't focusing on your marriage, isn't even focusing on yourself. The secret to being happily ever after is focusing on God. Francis Chan, who writes his book, You and Me Forever, he says that after 20 years of pastoral ministry, I have concluded that most marriage problems aren't really marriage problems, they're God problems. And they can be traced back to people having a poor relationship with God. And so if you're struggling in your marriage, it may be because you're struggling in your relationship with God. And it may be because you don't understand what God has designed for your marriage. And so what we're going to learn this morning is this, is that God designed marriage to be a lifelong committed relationship between one man and one woman, which points us to his love for us. So whether you are married in this room for a long time, newly married, maybe you're engaged, maybe you're single for this season, or maybe you're single for a reason, this message is for you because all marriages point us to the love of Jesus. And so let's just kind of unpack this thought here of what marriage is. And so what is marriage? It is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. Verse 24, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. What you learn in verses 18 through 24 is that marriage is God's idea from the very beginning. Marriage is not some sort of cultural invention. Uh, it is not some sort of patriarchal institution that is meant to subjugate women. Uh, what we see in Scripture is that it is ultimately God's plan for human flourishing. God in the creation mandate, as Pastor Andy talked about last week, is to be fruitful and to multiply. And it takes two to tango. And so God creates ways for that, he creates marriage to fulfill the creation mandate. And so what we see is the steps towards marriage. And what we see in Adam and Eve is we see a guy grows up, he gets a job, he worships God, he takes care of himself. Then he pursues a noble woman in a noble way. He marries a woman and they become one flesh. And so the Bible's kind of steps is first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby carriage. Now, the world kind of has an opposite view. The world's view is hook up, shack up, and then break up. But God has a different view. A man leaves his father's mother. That is, they move out of the house. Okay, they put up the PlayStation, and they go and they leave mom and dad, right? And then they hold fast. That word hold fast and can be translated to be glued to. Um, but even more so, it means to make a vow, to be united in a covenant, and so a covenant, uh, that's kind of a, a churchy word, uh, but it's, it's more than a contract. But, but what it is, it's, it's public vows of faithfulness. And so it is a set of promises between two people or groups of people that bind them together. And so a marriage covenant is a set of promises that a husband and a wife make to each other in front of others and before God. And this marriage covenant is a spiritual transaction. And so it's not a casual relationship that can easily be discarded. It is a relationship that has the power uh, to really set the course of your life and set the course of your future. And so it is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. And so at the marriage ceremony, maybe you've been to a marriage. Hopefully you showed up to your marriage ceremony. Uh, if you've been to a wedding, uh, in the marriage ceremony, it's less about uh, the present state of your feelings. It's more about the promises that you make to love and be faithful to each other in the future. And so love and romantic feelings can get you into a marriage. So I don't know if you saw the great theological movie, The Princess Bride. But there's that moment uh, where you have the preacher getting up there and he says, marriage. <laughs> Love is the reason for marriage. 
All right, so love will get you into marriage, but it's the promises you make to each other that will ultimately keep you in your marriage. And so the vows that you make are promises, are appointments you make in the future. So at your wedding, uh, you make vows and those promises you make to each other. And you promise to love, you promise to honor, you promise to cherish, you promise to serve one another in good times or bad, riches or poverty, to be true and loyal to each other till death do you part, all of which is in the future. And so you really don't need a vow to stick to someone in good times. When things are good, you don't feel like running. But what you need in the bad times is you need a covenant because the covenant is the glue that will bind you together. And so the, the marriage relationship is not a casual relationship. It's not a sticky note relationship. It is not even a consumer relationship. A covenant is not a consumer relationship because in a consumer relationship, the relationship lasts as long as it's beneficial to you. And so that means that you will stay connected as long as the other person is meeting your own particular needs at a cost that's acceptable to you. And so in a consumer relationship, you really don't have any obligation to stay in that relationship if you don't want to. In a consumer relationship, the individual's needs take precedence and are more important than the relationship. And so it really is, it's about what I want and what I need. And, and we, we live in a day of consumerism. We live in a day of rampant consumerism. And, and many of you kind of know what I'm talking about. I mean, think about this, the places that maybe you've ate at at a restaurant. You know, over the years, there are places that I used to eat at all the time. And, and normally I find a place that I like and I eat there a lot and, until, you know, something changes. And so there, there was a particular place in Sanford it's called Chianti's, and, and, I, and, I, and I love the place, and, and, and I, I love the food there. I love the, the people there, the service there. I knew the owner, and, 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 and everything was great until they switched from Coke to Pepsi, <laughs> and then it ruined everything, everything, because I'm not going to pay that much money to drink Pepsi. <laughs> Amen? Can I get a witness on that? Right? I mean, some people, you know, some of you want to testify on that. And so my loyalty ended when they switched from Coke to Pepsi because I did not want to pay for that. And so we have that kind of type of thing. Now, I kind of say that being funny, but, but people kind of do that with a lot of things in life. It, they'll, they'll, they'll buy certain products until that, that, that product doesn't necessarily fit what you want at the, at the cost that you think is acceptable. People even will try to transfer that to the church and, and I'll be a part of the church as long as the church does what I want it to do when I want it to do it. But if they ever change anything, I'm out. That's a consumer relationship. But here's the interesting thing. Marriage is a covenant relationship and church membership is a covenant relationship. And in a covenant relationship, especially a marriage relationship, the good of the relationship takes precedence over the immediate needs of the individual. So in other words, in a covenant relationship, my responsibility in that relationship is to sacrifice my wants and my needs for what is best for the relationship. So if, if, you know, I've had married couples come to me and they say, pastor, you know, we need some advice on this. We need some advice on that. My husband recently got a job or my wife recently got a job. And this job is going to really require a lot of, a lot of time. And, and, and it really doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, you know, for, for him to turn it down other than the fact that I will never see, we'll never see each other. And we think, you know, she's got concerns that, that if he takes this job, then it's really going to hurt the marriage. And so the answer is, well, you shouldn't take the job if it's going to hurt the marriage. Sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll hear people say, you know, I feel like that I need to move here, but, but you know what? If moving is gonna hurt our relationship, then maybe you shouldn't move. Or, or maybe if buying this or, or, or doing that is gonna hurt our relationship, you shouldn't do it because in a covenant relationship, you, it's not about me, it's about us. It's about us. And here's the thing. When you see, when the word, when the, when the Bible talks about love, Biblical love is measured by how much a person is willing to give up or sacrifice for the sake of the other person. So, I mean, think about how much God loves you. He loves you so much, he died on the cross for you. That's pretty big love. And so when you think about biblical love, it's not some ooey gooey, fuzzy feeling. It is an action. It is a choice. And it is often a sacrifice. And this is why people who are living together and you have one or both of them say, you know, I'm not willing to get married. I don't want to be in a covenant relationship. If somebody says to you, I don't mind living with you and I don't mind doing things with you, but I don't want to marry you. Here's what they're saying. I don't love you enough to give myself completely to you. 
And what happens is, is it, it starts out ideal, turns into an ordeal, and then people want a new deal. But this covenant relationship, for a lot of people, you can understand this, this deepness, this desire to sacrifice for the good of the other if you're a parent in the room. A parent-child relationship, often what you see with parents is that they will do what is best for their kids, even if it means sacrifice. How many of you that are parents in the room have, 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 have shed blood and sweat and tears for your children? And as great as that is for moms and dads to do that, that's how God intended marriage to be. God intended for you to sacrifice in your marriage. Now, our society sees that very strange. As a matter of fact, our society has kind of meatloaf theology. Meatloaf said, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. <laughs> meatloaf was asked many times what that was, and he would give different answers because he didn't have the answer. Often, I will do anything for love except for sacrifice what I want for the sake of us. And what the Bible teaches here is that your marriage must be the most important relationship in your life outside of your relationship with Jesus. No other human being should get more of your love, more of your energy, and more of your commitment than your spouse. And when the Bible says that God says that, we are to, that a man is to leave his father and his mother, in that day and in the ancient mindset, the most powerful and formative relationship a person had was with his mom and with his dad. And he says that you are to leave what was the most powerful relationship in your life and forge a new union with somebody else that is going to be a more important and a more powerful force in your life. And that is a relationship with your spouse because marriage is a covenant. Number two, not only what is it, but what is it for? Marriage is built for companionship. So if it says in verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother. The therefore points back to what was just said. What was just said starts actually in the immediate context in verse 18, where the Bible says that God said it's not good for man to be alone. There's this, this little run, this, this little poetry. Do, uh, pa Pastor Andy talked about this last week, where in Genesis chapter one, God did stuff and he said it was good, it was good, it was good. Six times God says it's good, it's good, it's good. On the sixth day, at the creation of humanity... God looks at the creation of, his, of, of mankind and he looks at Adam and he says, it's not good for Adam to be alone. And so God creates a female out of a, out, as a response to human loneliness. And so if you're lonely in the room, that's not a sin to be lonely. The ache of loneliness is the one ache that doesn't arise from sin. God created Adam, as we looked at last week, in his image. God lives in the eternal community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal and co-eternal. So God has always been with people that are his, have been within the Godhead of equals. And so Adam, being made in the image of God, needed someone in his life that was his equal, but yet was different from him. And so God created for Adam a companion. And so he says in verse 18, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a as their conigdo, a helper fit for him. And so from that, then uh, Moses walks us through that. And so verse 19, so out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens. Okay. And so out of the dust of the earth, uh, he creates uh, animals, he creates birds. And then what you notice here is that God gives Adam a job. Adam's job, is, Adam is the first wildlife inspector. Okay, And he's also given the responsibility to name the animals. So whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. And so uh, Adam said, that looks like a horse. A horse is a horse, a horse, a horse. You're a horse. Um, it's a cow. Yeah. Camel. Um, Duckbill platypus. And so God brings these animals to Adam, one after the other. And so the man names all the livestock, verse 20, and the birds of the heaven and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an Ezer Connecto, a helper fit. He notices as he's naming the animals that every one of them has someone like them, but unlike them. And so here, God works in Adam's life and God sees what's going on. And so verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep, divine anesthesia. 
knocks him slick out. Some of you say, Pastor, this happens to me every Sunday. <laughs> Blaming God. He says, Lord, I've... Anyway, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, one of his ribs, uh, he took one of his ribs. So God here does surgery. And he closes up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. Preachers say, it's kind of preacher talk, that he doesn't take uh, the bone uh, from the man's foot so that the uh, man would walk over the woman. He doesn't take the bone from his head uh, because uh, the Lord, it's not for her to lord over him, but the Lord takes a bone from his side so it would be close to his heart. Not surely why that's what God did, but it sounds awful good. But he takes this rib. And so Adam here is naming animals. Donkey. Goat, lion, whoa, man. <laughs> and then you have this first love song. It was a hit, number one hit in the world. In verse 23, this at last is bone of my bones. Q et a at last my love has come along. My lonely days are over. Life is like a song. It was like an unfulfilled longing was being met. There is now someone like me, but unlike me in ways that I like. She shall be called woman, Isha, wife, literally translated mine, dibs. <laughs> and I was like, she mine. <laughs> She mine because she came out of me. It's the same language that's found in the Songs of Solomon. Song of Solomon 2, two verse 16 uh, says, my beloved is mine and I am his. It's not a bad possessiveness. It's not controlling. It is mine in the sense that this is someone that I cherish, someone I desire, someone that I love, my person of all the people in the world. You are my person. This woman was specifically made for Adam. And so here, the Bible calls Eve an ezer konegdo, a helper fit, a helper suitable, someone like Adam, but unlike Adam in ways that Adam needs. This is a complementarian relationship. Our church, we are complementarian. And that is, we believe that men and women are equal in uh, essence, value, dignity, and worth, but different in function. And so the word helper here does not mean subservient or less than, but it means that someone who can provide help and strength in areas that you need help in. And the Bible calls God our helper. He calls God our Ezer. And so it doesn't mean that God is less than us because he is our helper. So what you see is that the woman God creates complements the man. You know, some things by themselves are good, but some things when put together are better, like milk and cereal. Cinnamon Toast Crunch with milk, you get the drippings, it is heavenly nectar. Amen? Peanut butter and chocolate, right? I'm sorry for you folks that have peanut allergies, but it's good. <laughs> Peas and carrots, beans and cornbread. Amen? We got any southern folks in here? I said that at 9.30 and they kind of stared at me. <laughs> I'm from the south, y'all. We put, we get pinto beans. Some people, some folks call them soup beans. Hey, for the glory of God, we're going to have revival here in a minute. <laughs> and then you get cornbread. Some of you younger folks, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but it's like, it's good. And you, you put the cornbread in the soup beans and it soaks up all the juice and brother, it's on. <laughs> Amen. Anybody want to testify on that one? Amen. <laughs> Woo, glory. Amen. And then there is chicken nuggets and Chick-fil-A sauce. Amen? Amen. That's, that's, that's the way life was intended to be. And that's why God, God creates man and woman. Man by himself is okay. Woman by herself is okay. You put man and woman together, wow. Wow. Because they're going to be sprouting youngins. And it's going to be great. And so what you see here is that two become one flesh. That's what he says in verse 24. The math of marriage is one plus one equals one. And so the relationship between a husband and wife is unlike any other re earthly relationship. And outside of your relationship with Jesus, your relationship with your spouse should be the primary relationship, even more than parent and child. And so this one flesh relationship means that when you get married, you are a single entity. Now in marriage, 
Your lives are intertwined in such a way that everything literally becomes one. Your future families become one. Your future happiness and successes become one. Your bank accounts, your emotional lives, your sexual lives, literally where you become one physically. And so marriage is friendship with real benefits. Uh, Jonathan Haidt uh, writes in his book, The Happiness Hypothesis, he talks about two different types of love. One he talks about is passionate love and the other type of love he calls companionate love. Passionate love, which is our world is obsessed with, um, is wildly emotional with elation and also pain, anxiety and relief, altruism and Jealousy coexists. It's like a drug. It increases the serotonin in your brain and it gives you a high, but it wears off in time. It's kind of the tender love. But companionate love is love that grows over time. It's mutual affection felt by two people whose lives are deeply intertwined and it grows stronger over time as the partners apply caregiving, trust, and attachment and it endures and lasts a lifestyle, lifetime. And so passionate love and companion love, our world is obsessed with passionate love. Again, it's that hook up and then break up love. Companionate love is different. Passionate love is like a flame. For the first few months, it starts out like a fever, hotter than a pepper sprout. But then it quickly goes out as it came in. Companionate love is like a vine that grows together. It slowly intertwines and it produces an unbreakable wall. It's slow and steady and strong. And that's why in the Old Testament, the word for marriage partner can also be translated friend. See, your spouse must be your best friend. And if someone of another gender becomes a better friend to you than your spouse, you are going to be in trouble. Your spouse must be the one that you can fight in. Your spouse must be the one that you trust the most. Your spouse must be the one person who walks in when everyone else walks out. See, God created marriage to provide an intimate relationship. And what you see, the ache of the, the, ache of the world today is people are longing for intimacy. That's what the longing is, for intimacy. And the problem with things like pornography is pornography can maybe give you one thing, but it cannot give you intimacy. Pornography can give you a quick fix, but it cannot give you a real relationship. And and in pornography, the person may be exposed outwardly, but nothing on the inside is exposed. And what we're longing for is not just what's on the outside, it's really what's on the inside because the ache of every human in the world is intimacy. And the way to define intimacy is this, into me you see. To be fully known, fully loved without rejection. That's what we're longing for. And so when marriage is about that, when it's about friendship, You're not just looking for someone who's physically attractive. You're not just looking for someone who's financially well off. You're looking for someone who is your equal, who can be your friend. And what you're looking for is not a fling. You're looking for a friend. That's why for successful relationships, for for relationships to be successful, the first connection must be a spiritual connection. There's a little graph I want to show you. It's called the marriage pyramid. And in this marriage pyramid, uh, this is something that in my, uh, in my seminary classes and, and something that I use when I do premarital counseling, hopefully you, you see it there on the screen there, is that you, it's kind of like, have you ever thought of the, you ever seen the food pyramid? In the food pyramid, kind of the, the thing at the bottom is the most important and the thing at the top, which is the smallest, is the least important. So like you have fruits and vegetables are very important and then you have like mayonnaise and lard <laughs> and Skittles are at the top, Okay. And now in our world, in the world, they invert this. And so in our world, the most important thing is physical, then relational, and then spiritual is just, if it happens, it happens. But what you're going to find is that the roots of your problems in marriage are always going to find spiritual roots. And so if you're, if you're not having physical intimacy, it's often because you're a jerk, And you're a jerk because there's some sort of spiritual issue there. And at the core of you, the reason why you're a jerk is that there may be some sort of idol in your life, some sort of anger in your life, some sort of issue in your life. And so as you think about it, every issue, almost every issue in your marriage is going to have some sort of spiritual roots. And that's why it's imperative that you should never date or marry someone who's not a Christian. You say, well, pastor, he's hot. Well, so is hell. (laughs) 
for a marriage to truly work, you have to be able to open up and share the deepest parts of yourself. And if you're committed to Jesus and your partner is not, when you open up all that you are to him, they're not going to understand and you're going to feel weird and you're going to feel violated. Now listen, if, if you're married to someone who isn't a believer, I'm not saying leave them or give up or anything like that. I'm saying pray for them and love them. Point them to Jesus. Raise your children to love and know Jesus. But if you want to be successful, start out with someone who's a believer. So the first question you should ask anybody that you date is, do you love Jesus? And if they say no, you call an Uber. <laughs> you don't stay for dessert. You don't pass go. You don't collect $200. You hit the dough. You call an Uber or you call a preacher, we'll get you out. <laughs> All right? Just say no. Just say no. What is marriage's covenant? What is it built for? It's built for companionship. What does it show? Why would God design this? What's, what's he doing? Is it a cruel joke? No. Marriage pictures Christ in the church. Verse 24, which we've been camping out a lot in this morning, is quoted by Jesus. So Jesus affirms the Genesis account, Matthew chapter 19. It's also quoted by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5. And what you see in Ephesians 5 is that Paul takes what Jesus in Genesis says and uses it to teach that the first marriage and all marriages thereafter give a picture of God's love for his people. God designed marriage and everything that goes with it to give us a taste of his love for us. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, he says, therefore, uh, a man shall leave his father's mother, hold fast to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. He says, this mystery is profound. I'm referring, I'm saying that it, it refers, it points to Christ and the church. That word mystery is mega mystery. It's an extraordinarily great, wonderful, profound truth that can only be understood by the help of God's spirit. And the divine mystery of marriage and the purpose of God uniting one man and one woman for one lifetime is to picture the relationship of Christ in the church. God says, listen, you want to know how much my son loves his people? Look at marriage. I mean, when God invented marriage, he had already had the saving work of Jesus on his mind. And so our marriages in this room or those online, our marriages, although not perfect, picture the gospel to the world, picture the gospel to our children, and picture the gospel to ourselves. And God loves to paint pictures. And so in this, we see that God is saying, husbands, if you desert your wife, you show the world that Christ deserts his people. If you ignore your wife, husbands, you show that Christ wants nothing to do with his people. If you look at pornography or cheat on her, you're showing that Christ is not loyal to his people. If you do not care for your wife above your own needs and wants, and you're showing the world that Christ does not care for us. If you, husband, are hateful and hurtful to your wife, you're saying that Jesus is hateful and hurtful. Wives, if you sleep around on your husbands, you're showing the world that Christ is not satisfying enough for his people. If you talk bad about your husband and disrespect him, you show the world that Christ is not worth respecting. If you do not follow your husband, then you're showing the world that Christ is not worth following. Your marriage is a picture of the gospel. It is a living, breathing gospel track. And therefore, any deviation, distortion, or perversion of or from God's design for marriage is a big deal to God and should be a big deal to us. And that's why divorce and sex outside of marriage and same-sex marriages are wrong because it's not what God originally designed. And any change from what God has designed is not God's best for our lives. And any change, distortion, or perversion is a smear, a smack, and a stain on God's honor and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important. But for those of you in this room, your marriage is struggling. For some of you, those of you in this room that your life is falling apart, what our marriage pictures is what we need to make our marriage work. The gospel. The gospel teaches us that Jesus gave himself up and died to himself to save us and make us his forever. And so as we give up ourselves, as we die to ourselves, as we repent and believe the gospel and submit our lives to his will, that is the pattern and the power to make marriage work and to make your life work. Tim Keller says that the reason that marriage is so painful yet so wonderful is because it reflects the gospel, which is both painful and wonderful at once. 
The gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, yet we're at the very same time more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Whether you're married or not, here's what you have to understand, that the gospel gives you the power to forgive when you've been wrong. When you've been wronged, it gives you the power to forgive. The gospel gives you the, the humility to say that you're sorry when you've wronged someone else, when you've wronged your spouse. The gospel gives you the patience that you need to love your spouse because if God can be patient with you, you can be patient with them. The gospel gives us the grace to overcome difficulties because if God can save me from hell, he can save me from anything else. The gospel gives us a common mission that keeps us moving forward and keeps us together. And the gospel gives us a common vision for the future in the midst of much uncertainty in life. It's the gospel. That's what gives us the power to stay together. A few years ago, when the kids were little, um, we put together this Mickey Mouse puzzle. We're trying to. And, and it was kind of those wooden ones, a few pieces, but those big old wooden ones. We took it out of the box and we started to put it together, kids put it together, and there was one piece missing. It was the middle piece and it was Mickey's face. I mean, it's the one piece that makes the whole puzzle make sense and it was missing. And so we started looking everywhere. When I say we, I mean me. I looked here, I looked there, I looked under the couch. And if you've never looked under the couch, it can be dangerous. I looked in the toy box. I looked here. I looked there. I couldn't find it anywhere. So in frustration, we took that puzzle, ripped it apart, put it back in the box, and I threw it in the trash. Because what good is a puzzle without the centerpiece? You know, could it be that the one thing that's missing in your marriage is the greatest need for your marriage? Your greatest need in marriage is not to read more books or to make more money, or to have a better sex life. Your greatest need in marriage is Jesus Christ at the center of it. And you and I need to remind ourselves of the gospel every day and remind us what's truly important. And many times in our lives, we get so upset and so frustrated with our spouse, and we forget the gospel. We think that what's happening here on earth is all that there is. But what may be missing in your marriage is the only one who can give you strength that you need in your marriage. Whenever I do a wedding ceremony, I do a little sermonette. Normally, I sound like Charlie Brown's teacher for those getting married. They're just ready to say what they got to say, put a ring on, and eat cake, and get out of there. And so I normally say this. And so, since, you know, if I've ever... I think it's good for you to hear as well. Here's what I say. I say, God's design for marriage is not to make us happy but to make us holy. Our marriages point us to the fact that we desperately need a savior. We do not have the resources or the ability to love our spouses the way that Jesus Christ loves us. But if you wanna to stay together and love one another, then Christ must be at the center of your life. He must be the glue that holds you together. As you both grow more like him, you will both grow closer together. April and I have been married almost 14 years. Been good days and bad days, rich, not very many rich days, but a lot of poor days. Sick days, healthy days. But the strength of our marriage is not how we feel in the moment, not how much money's in the bank, or even the happiness we experience that day. The strength of our marriage is in the promises that we have made and the person that we trust in the most. And his name is Jesus. Who do you trust in the most? If you're trusting in your spouse the most, they'll let you down. They will. They'll let you down. If you trust in yourself, you'll let yourself down. But if you trust in Jesus, he'll never let you down. He's the strength of your life. You say, Pastor, I'm not married. What does this do for me? It does everything. Because here's a beautiful thing. God does provide for those that are not married opportunities for relationships that are deeper than just plutonic. He provides it in the church. If you're here and you're single or you're lonely, he provides the church so that you can have relationships with people that'll point you to Jesus Christ. If you're here and you need Jesus, he's the answer. And if you're married in this room and your marriage is falling apart, the first step to see something happen is to admit you can't fix your problems and to trust that Jesus can. And we wanna be there to help you. 
Would y'all pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I ask your Holy Spirit to do what your Holy Spirit does, and that's convict sinners and call us to Christ, to point us, to convince us to the truths of the gospel. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would just do that And God, I pray for the marriages in this room and I pray for those that have needs. I pray, God, that that they would come to a place of honesty where they would stop trying to white knuckle their marriage and they would say, I can't fix it. Jesus, you can. And for those in this room that aren't married, God, would they see that you are enough, that you've provided a community for them to deal with loneliness and that's the church. We pray, God, that we as a church would come along singles, widows, widowers, and help them, point them, to Jesus Christ. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and I don't know about you, but if you're in this room and you're with your husband or your wife, I would take them by the hand and pray over them as we sing about God's promises. Thank you for joining us as we go through God's Word together. I pray again that God will transform you from the inside out. So as we say here at first, you have come to church. Go out and be the church. Have a great week of worship. We can't wait to see you soon.